Hey, good day, everybody, and welcome. It's great to see everybody here. Uh, we've got a great program for you today, and there's a number of other things we want to cover. First of all, for those of you who don't know, I'm Chris Holman, and this is part of our six-time-a-year speaking date that we have through the Michigan Business Network. And it's great to have you here. We always try to bring pertinent information, personalities, and uh, people that can interact and basically enrich in our lives with their outside perspective and their knowledge. So that's what this is kind of all about. I want to start, as we always do, by thanking our sponsors today, Shaheen Chevrolet and Dean Transportation, the MSU Broad Business College, the Capital Region International Airport. I'm sure you all have your tickets, right? Okay. Eagle Eye and Channel 10 is our media sponsor. And we really appreciate them because, quite frankly, these things don't happen without those sponsors. They just don't make ends meet. Um, yeah, thank you. Appreciate it, Carl. You know, one of the real values of this uh, uh, grouping is that uh, the same as it is at all of our meetings here in Lansing is that we get people together, we get to network, and we get to share information. So we're going to do what we always call our community roundtable real quick. Continue eating. Don't worry about it. Uh, especially you, Doug, because you're going to have some duties here soon. <laughs> um, so let's go around the room and see what's happening. Ralph uh, Shaheen is here. Uh, Ralph, give us a little update on not only your sales, but, uh, you know, the auto industry and what's happening. Well, thank you, Chris. Um, business at Shaheen Chevrolet has been brisk all summer. We've got lots of inventory. Uh, we're in our uh, ninth or tenth month with our new quick loop facility. No, it's longer than that. It's about 14 months. Um, we built last May an eight-bay quick loop facility. We're servicing over 100 vehicles a day. Uh, we're, we sell tires there now. Uh, General Motors has a great program for tires. Our body shop has expanded. Our uh, parts department has expanded. We now service northern Michigan through a uh, warehouse in Farwell, Michigan. Um, we have 14 trucks on the road up there and about 14 trucks on the road uh, in southern Michigan. We go down to Fort Wayne and um, parts of Indiana. Uh, we're selling over a million dollars a month in uh, wholesale parts. Our uh, sales has been very brisk. Our uh, new car department is uh, number one in the area, and our uh, used car department is as well. And uh, business has been very good in, at Shaheen Chevrolet. And it, interestingly, uh, leasing has become very big. I don't know if you, you folks have been uh, involved in buying a new vehicle. If you haven't, you should. Um, <laughs> but leasing now is uh, 35 to 40 percent of our business. So. It's a, it works very, if it works for you, it's a, it's a, it's a great thing because uh, digital technology doubles every couple years and these cars are getting better and better all the time. So business is good, come see us. Excellent, so, and I will tell you too, by the, uh, just a quick comment on your back room that's doing so well, it's more of a drive-through. I, I had my truck lube oil filtered there and I don't think I got out of the truck before everything was done, so. You know, one of the things we have, one of the things we have now is we have over 100 uh, loaner vehicles. So you shouldn't be without a vehicle. Anytime you need service, let us know, and we can set you up with a loaner vehicle because we have 100 now in stock just for customer use. Can you get a loaner vehicle for six months? Is that? No. Just, sorry. Yes, you can. You just have some paperwork to just sign. Just trying to play the angles, all right? <laughs> all right. Uh, Wayne, I see you here. Are you going to uh, make some comments on the capital area, um, capital region international airport? Thank you, Chris. I uh, just want to... Welcome everyone here. Appreciate everyone's uh, participation and support of our airport. Uh, give you a few things. We, uh, as you know, we have direct service uh, uh, through Delta, United, and uh, starting last year, middle of last year, American Airlines. Uh, not only direct service to uh, Detroit, Chicago, uh, Minneapolis, and Washington, D.C., but access anywhere. Uh, appreciate your utilization of the airport. Uh, if you look at our numbers and utilization of the airport, uh, January through July uh, of this year, we're up over 60,000 passengers from where we were uh, in the first seven months of last year. So thank you uh, for that. Uh, last year was uh, uh, increased expansion with our international service with uh, Apple Vacations. That's going to continue uh, this year. So before you find yourself in 24 inches of snow and no tickets to uh, get on an Apple Vacation to go to Cancun, um, Jamaica or the Dominican Republic, make sure you contact your travel agent, or get on the web and, uh, and get your seat. That service runs uh, December uh, to April. 
So make sure you, you do that. The other thing I want to just uh, make everyone aware, if getting through Lansing Airport wasn't quick enough for you, we, uh, uh, and it's really, really quick through TSA and everything like that, but we are offering uh, the ability to sign up with uh, TSA through PreCheck. That's going to be the week of October 9th. So you can find information on flylancing.com. Uh, again, you're going to get through Lansing real quick, but when you're in another city and don't want to wait in the long lines, uh, that will help you uh, get, get through their, their long lines. So thank you all. Excellent. You, you missed the opportunity to say that our numbers went up as soon as you got hired. I mean, that's, you know, come on, you got a big format here. Uh, <laughs> uh, Dean Transportation, uh, I didn't see Kelly or Patrick come in. Uh, Courtney, I did see you. Did you want to make a comment? One of the, one of the comments, where's Dean? Sorry, overlooking everything. Courtney, would you uh, just emphasize the fact of what a busy week this particular week is and what's happened with you folks because you've expanded. Yes, so Dean Transportation is very busy right now as we've had school starting all across the state. We've expanded in four new districts this year, so we're very excited to have everything off to a great start. And the motor coach division is very busy with the start of school as well. And we're happy to also be a part of the campaign that announced yesterday, the Lansing Strong for Texas campaign. So keep your eyes open for drop-off locations throughout the Lansing region where you can deliver supplies, um, and we will be transporting those down to the Harvey victims on Tuesday. So thank you for all your support. Busy stuff, really is, and all those buses out there. Um, I, don't, uh, I don't see anyone from LEAP. Is anybody from LEAP here right now? Nope, yes? Oh, oh, God, Steve, sorry. What's going on? As if you don't have anything going on. No, Steve will be in with LEAP. Uh, from a standpoint, what's going on, it just seems a whole bunch of stuff's going on in our region. Our entire team almost is over there. If you guys raise your hands real quick. Uh, the, the one thing that we're seeing a lot of, is, as many of you know, is just a lot of investment by businesses. Neogen just continues to invest in our region. That's such a great story. We have a team of entrepreneur uh, leaders, Tony and CISO and, and Joe Carr and Molina, and they're just constantly working with the entrepreneurs to grow their businesses. And what often gets lost with Neogen is Neogen was an entrepreneurial story that employs hundreds and hundreds of people in our region, so we're continuously doing that. Uh, downtown East Lansing is on the brink of change. I mean, I'm, when we talk about change, Park District is gearing up to be demolished. Center City is gearing up for construction. So we're really going to see a transformational look in downtown East Lansing. We're actually with Skyview uh, opening. We're seeing the change of our skyline. So there's a lot of things going on. Uh, this year, we're truly looking at a record year. And it just amazes us and our staff that how many people are continuing to grow and how many people are looking to invest in our region. And I would be remiss with one last thing to say is the folks from the MEDC, if everybody from the MEDC could raise their hand, those are people at the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. Those are all people that uh, work, with, work with us on a daily basis on projects and having them right here within our region is a, a key part of what we do and we're thankful for that. Great stuff, really is. You guys do a great job. Uh, Edie, anything that you want to mention here with uh, Capital Area Michigan Works? I know you guys are doing a ton in that, uh, getting our workforce ready. We're doing quite a bit. Um, but what I want to just briefly mention is our manufacturing week, actually, that will be occurring that first week in October. Uh, which will culminate with uh, Manufacturing Day on October 6th. And the Capital Area Manufacturing Council, led by M Michelle Cordano, they have been busy. They so far have 20 schools or ISDs or RISAs that are going to be participating. We have 24 manufacturers that are going to be hosting young people throughout the day and we so far have 1,106 young people that will have an opportunity to see firsthand what is going on in the manufacturing world in the capital region so we're very excited about that. Well we're excited too because uh, you're going to hear in just a second when I do the MFBI how important that talent has become. Uh, okay so Tim Damon I saw you here Tim what's happening at the chamber? Well, thanks, Chris. Um, 
it, probably just to echo and tag on to what Steve said, I mean, we, we continue to see the optimism from our members in the business community here at levels we haven't probably seen in over a decade. And so we continue to see a great deal of investment um, from our business community. So it's very optimistic and it shows no signs of, uh, of stopping. And I know we'll talk, there's a lot of talk about talent. I'm sure Chris will talk about it, but to Edie's point, and we've been working very closely uh, with Mich Capillary Michigan Works and other entities too on addressing some of the talent uh, issues. We're launching our third Leadership Lansing class. We'll start in October. If you haven't been part of that or familiar with it, you know, please feel free to, to reach out to either myself or uh, Kristen Beltzer at the Chamber. Uh, it's been a great program. I think we've ran 70 individuals through uh, in the first two years. It's been a great exposure to the region and all the things that are happening here from manufacturing to healthcare. We did a tour of the airport uh, with the last class um, last April, uh, getting to tour the GM factories. And so we really do a great job of getting them exposure throughout the region, everything that's happening here economically. Uh, the 11th year at 10 over the next 10 will be coming up later this month as well in partnership with the great uh, the Grand River Connection Young Professionals Group. So it's busy, busy, busy. And on top of that, we got election season coming up too, right? So there's a, a new mayor in the city of Lansing and city council races, both in Lansing and East Lansing, and we're working closely there with our endorsed candidates. There's an election coming up? Yeah, can, yeah I believe that, right? <laughs> okay. You haven't heard yet? Tim, thanks. I appreciate it. Oh, I've heard. As a matter of fact, along those lines, before we go to the, the next person, uh, who's Jake Schroeder, MEDC, um, let me acknowledge, too, that we have uh, Bruce and Callie here from uh, Senator Peter's office and Senator Stabenow's office. Give a wave. We appreciate that. You take this back. Your, your bosses have always been a tremendous boon for this uh, this city and this region, we appreciate it. Jake, what's going on at MEDC? Well, there's a ton going on at the MEDC, but uh, I think Steve kind of stole my thunder. That's okay, I, I like it. Uh, we have uh, actually my partner, Melissa Danzero. She's our business development manager from the MEDC for the Lansing area. Uh, Melissa, can you wave? There, there, there She's she is. practiced the Queen's yep. wave, I like yep, that. Yep, absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. And uh, she is your premier contact for anything and everything MEDC. Uh, so, so please stop by and talk to her if you have not met her. She's a wonderful person to meet. Uh, I actually work on the international trade team uh, with the Michigan Economic Development Corporation. So without diving very deep into our programs, we have funding available, we have uh, market research type activities available, uh, we have a variety of our partners in the room, whether they be Michigan State or U.S. Commercial Services or Foster Swift, or I apologize if there's more here that I did not get a chance to chat with. But uh, basically, if you're a business in the Lansing area or you work with businesses in the Lansing area that are looking to expand your exports, um, you have to come see us. Again, funding available, whole variety of resources that can help you grow that that aspect of your business. So we're excited to do it. So come see me. And you're also working closely with the airport who freight forwards that stuff. We're an international port. Yeah, so. I've got to get on that list of Good uh, for everybody. Premier flyers. Hopefully, uh, you know, my association with Chris Holman isn't uh, going to keep me off. It won't be as right. detrimental as you thought. Okay. okay. All right. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> Thanks, Jake. Appreciate it. All right. Um, uh, very quickly, I want to run down the latest uh, MFBI, which is the Michigan Future Business Index. Uh, this thing is put on by the uh, Accident Fund, who sponsors it and who, who grabbed up the mantle on this thing several years back and has been wonderful. And uh, Bob Lipinski's in the room and Accident Fund people give a wave. We, I really appreciate your support because without you guys, this really pertinent information doesn't get to our business community. Uh, and the other one, of course, is uh, came out from Detroit just for this, Paul King from Inside. ROI. He's the guy who's been doing it how many years? Since you were 12, maybe? Something like that. Long time. Matter of fact, three different companies before you started your own, you were doing this, uh, this index, and we appreciate all the work. He takes the data and translates it into things that people like me can understand. So that's really um, All right, so this MFBI, which has not been published yet, I don't believe, has it? Oh, all right, it's just been released. It's uh, it, for more in-depth and more explanation and to pour over it, it's on the uh, Michigan uh, Business Network's uh, website, so you want to go there. Uh, but what happened is, uh, oh, by the way, happy birthday. I almost ran past that. Paul's birthday was yesterday. Um, there's record optimism in the, uh, the state economy and uh, business leaders. They're planning to increase investment uh, into their, uh, their businesses through wage increases and uh, equipment updates. So this is very significant given the reports of wage stagnation across the rest of the country. So 
we are uh, we are giving a new or looking at new wages for people, and that's kind of a, a, a double situation. One is uh, you always want to keep your people, but it shows you're feeling good about growth. The other is there's a problem, and that's talent shortage, which we're going to get into in a minute. So to keep your people, there's a few things that you can do. Wage increase is one of those. Um, regarding the uh, the business climate in the state, uh, a record 79% of business owners say that they're satisfied with the economy. Now that's up from 66% one year ago, which was a pretty phenomenal number then. Regarding some of the hiring challenges in the state, 51% of the respondents believe that their access to qualified, I emphasize that, qualified personnel is either only fair or poor. So these numbers continue to stay in the negative uh, as they've been for most of this decade, as a matter of fact. Um, the other thing that that's impacting is the number two issue, which is dealing with growth. And by that we mean without people, we can't grow. So at this point in time, we're seeing the economy's anchor right now is the lack of talent. Um, Overall, optimism continues to blossom in Michigan's recovering business market. Uh, Michigan businesses are leading the way in increasing employee wages compared to the stagnant wages being reported throughout the rest of the country. And while challenges remain, small businesses are creating their own solutions. And, uh, and that's pretty good. So get into the report deeper than I gave you here, but I will tell you this is one of the best reports that we've had since we've had the Michigan Future Business Index put out by the Accident Fund Insurance Company. So there's your good news for the day. That should, uh, that should make you feel pretty good. Um, we're going we're gonna to take a quick break here. We'll have lunch. We'll be back in 15 minutes, and then we'll hear from a phenomenal speaker, and we're very lucky to have uh, Doug Berry here. And we have a guest introducer that you'll be very excited about. So stay with us. We'll be right back. All right, I hope you enjoyed your lunch, and I'd like to start out with a hand for the staff here and the people that do such a great job for us. Uh, and, and of course, we want to thank, as always, our sponsors. Can't thank them enough. Uh, Sheen Chevrolet, MSU Broad Business College, Dean Transportation, Capital Region International Airport, uh, WILX Channel 10, and Eagle Eye, where we are. Um, and, and did I say Sheen? I'm sorry, did I say? <laughs> <laughs> Some of you paid a little more for your sponsorship than others. <laughs> All right, next time you bring your parole officer. Uh, got a couple things to give away. You notice you put your cards uh, in a bowl on the way in. Uh, so we have foursomes to the uh, Majestic. If you haven't played there, uh, you're missing something. You should have 27 holes stretched over 1,600 acres. Just a beautiful facility in Heartland, Michigan. Um, first winner from uh, PHP, Holly. Hey, congratulations, where's Holly? Yeah, there you go, congratulations. We've got a foursome for you up here. And the second winner is from LaughQ, Kelly Ellsworth, at your son, yeah. Huh? Did you, did you happen, to, I'll drop him by, I'll come down there. Did you happen to he, he, overhear what she whispered to Tim? Finally, something positive out of my relationship with Chris. Thanks. Thank. It's <laughs> All right. So uh, today we have a, an interesting topic and one very close to my heart. And of course, the guy that's going to introduce uh, the topic as well, close to his heart. And so I'm going to bring him up with that uh, to do the introductions uh, from uh, the uh, Eli Broad School of Business. And among other things, uh, also runs Cyber, the Center for International Business Education and Research. And uh, we'll bring him out with uh, bring him up without further ado. Uh, my good friend Thomas Holt. So I've known Chris Holman for 17 years. That was the first time he spelled out the Cyber acronym actually correctly. That was fantastic. Uh, <coughs> Here we're just known as the International Business Center in the Eli Broad College of Business. And uh, these audiences, uh, not just the Michigan Business Network, but a lot of these local events are fantastic networking opportunities because frankly we have so many different partners in the room 
Uh, at tables four and 10, we have uh, lots of friendly faces from the International Business Center, uh, but we also have uh, a number of partners in the room that sort of make the international business and trade story for our community work well. Uh, just to give you a little bit, we have 15,000 companies from Michigan, give or take, that went international last year. 90% uh, of them are small and medium-sized companies, and that's really close to Doug uh, Barry's heart, our speaker for today. So we work obviously with uh, I, I get Natalie, sorry again, Schmiko's name, last name. Say hi, Natalie. You've said hi twice now today. Michigan Economic Development Corporation. Obviously, work, we work with uh, James Schmitko Summer. She's sitting at the same table, actually, at the Michigan Department of Agriculture, the international aspect of it. And Kendra Kuo is somewhere there as well. If you don't know Kendra Kuo, she's uh, also the helper for our USIAC office. Uh, those are the commercial service office that uh, are part of the Department of Education, the Department of Commerce, rather, that uh, help local companies then go international. Out of those 15,000 companies that went international, since 2006, we've had touch points with about 2,000 of them. So there are a lot of free advice, free help, and MDC was uh, uh, also selling free money, so to speak. It's a matching kind of scenario in most cases. And I would be remiss if I didn't say hi to Gene Stokel as well, because Foster Swift has been a fantastic partner in everything we do as the International Business Center forever. So tables four and 10, if you want to know more about the International Business Center and our partners and perhaps what international trade help we can come up with for you. Doug Berry was in the Department of Commerce seemingly forever. <clears throat> I think he left about a year ago or so, and his last title was Deputy Director of the Global Knowledge Center. But he's held a whole slew of different titles, if anybody wants to play along with the, some of the details that I will skip in this story as well. Uh, anyway, he's a former senior trade specialist for the U.S. Commercial Service, and that is the Global Business Solutions Unit of the U.S. Department of Commerce. So he flew in from Washington, D.C. to hang out with us today. But Kendra is here to represent the Commercial Service branch as well that serves the greater Lansing area. And we have three of these offices, Pontiac as well as Detroit in the state of Michigan also. For the U.S. Department, uh, Department of Commerce, Doug Berry uh, was then an international trade specialist, also in the Russia New Independent States Office, Director of Corporate Partnerships, Director of Marketing and Communications, and he's also been Executive Director of Trade Promotion Programs, as well as Commercial Service Officer at U.S. Embassies in Thailand, Singapore, and China. Uh, and on this, the title is on this sheet, so if you want to keep it, but I call it the Bible to exporting. A basic guide to exporting has been around for about 70 or 80 years now in an edited book format. And Doug edited the last version, last few versions of them. Uh, and I call it the Bible to exporting because especially for small and medium-sized companies, that truly spells out everything for U.S. companies going overseas in, in many different directions. Uh, it's not on your sheet, but I believe he has been deputy mayor. We got a few uh, politically oriented operatives in the room as well. If you want to talk politics, we do have a mayor election coming up shortly for Lansing. He, he's played the, in that arena as well. He was an educator in Alaska in Anchorage for a while. There he served as executive director of the Alaska Center for International Business. And that included the, the World Trade Center of Alaska and the American Russia Center as well. And then uh, um, he likes being on tape, whether it's hanging out with videotape uh, front or back, but he was a producer for ABC News based in both New York and London uh, in his prior life before Department of Commerce. And there he won numerous national awards for his television documentary work. Uh, it was up on the slide here before. He's got a bachelor's and a master's and then finally a PhD from Columbia University. Uh, so we've been hanging out with Doug Berry, or I've been hanging out with him for about 15 years now. He's been a tremendous friend, and Chris Holman and Doug Berry were both on a panel that I put together here a couple of years ago, I think, and Chris and I kind of colluded on this one. I thought Doug Berry would be not only a fantastic resource, and I think you hopefully will see him as a resource even after he leaves here today, but also a fantastic, and I sometimes call him a goofy speaker because he energizes at least me, and hopefully he energizes all of you. So help me welcome Doug Berry to the stage. You got your own mic. Ah, thank you. Um, what a generous uh, introduction. Uh, leaving me time to tell you, my name is Doug Barry, telephone number 202-503-5413. Thank you very much. Uh, have a nice <laughs> afternoon. 
No, that, thank you, Thomas. That was a great uh, introduction, and I appreciate it. Um, uh, and it was so wonderful to have a stand-up comedian as your uh, host this afternoon. He was warning me earlier that uh, I dare not activate the microphone when I go into the restroom uh, for fear that if I do, you will be treated with some sounds, restroom-type sounds that might, you know, embarrass me later. And interestingly enough, uh, the first thing I thought of was a client that we at the U.S. Commercial Service had a number of years ago, and I think we still do. And the name of the client is Falcon Waterless Urinals. And without going into all of the details and the scientific uh, technology behind it, they uh, were a small company that uh, I think it was during the great water shortage in Los Angeles uh, about 12 or 15 years ago. And a couple of guys, uh, engineers, went out to a bar and were imbibing some beers and thought, this is terrible. We have to use the uh, water from the shower and the, and the dirty dishes in order to flush the toilet because we're on water rations. So what they did is to go into their laboratory, and a little while later, they came out with this waterless urinal. And we help them market it all over the world. And today, uh, you will find it at the Beijing International Airport uh, in the men's room only. Uh, but it's a phenomenal success story where they are now in 35 foreign countries selling this particular technology. So, you know, it's, it's a, a wonderful thing when you find someone like that who can take an opportunity and turn it into an amazing uh, business, in an, a global business. And, uh, of course, I flew into the beautiful airport uh, this morning here in Lansing, the capital city airport. Great service, beautiful facility. And uh, I, I thought, well, I came from Washington, D.C., which is a bit of a, uh, you know, hike. And uh, it reminded me of uh, the way in which our country, many people in our country... Whoa. Is that okay now? I'll put it down a little bit. Oh, where is it? Oh, he has it. <laughs> he has it. So um, I was, uh, you know, a little self-conscious this past uh, summer vacation, took the wife and kids to Maine in the backwoods, where I spent a wonderful week. And one day, we took the car, uh, trying to do something interesting, away from the lake, found a little jewelry store there that was making customized uh, things, and parked the car. Went in and shopping around. So the wife was shopping. I was on a park bench close by, listening to a couple of people, middle-aged couple, uh, strolled around and saw the car uh, sitting there, and the husband uh, said to the wife, uh, ah, look, they're blocking the driveway, and, and the, where are they from? And so the wife went around and looked at the license plate, and she said, Washington, D.C. And the husband looked at her and said, that figures. <laughs> so, of course, folks in Washington, D.C., especially now that the politicians uh, are back in town. I know we have you know, representatives of your great uh, Senate delegation here. Uh, you can always tell uh, an elected official in Washington, D.C. because they walk around town holding their own hand. <laughs> so what I wanted to do uh, is to tell you about some big, big trends that are affecting our country, the world, and you. And uh, here, are, here are some of them. Uh, first uh, the, is the pushback on globalization. Uh, many people are unnerved uh, by the immigration trends around the world, uh, unnerved by technological change, uh, blaming it on trade, international trade. And uh, this has had a big effect uh, everywhere. You certainly see it in Europe with regard to uh, Brexit. Uh, you see it in this country with regard to uh, foreign trade agreements, specifically NAFTA. 
and uh, you'll you see it in the um, just in the political climate in general. And so then the the next uh, part of this trend is the twilight of regional trade agreements. If in fact it is a twilight of the trade agreement, we've we've heard that uh, the Korea uh, free trade agreement may go. Uh, there's opposition to it. President Trump has said that it's not a good deal. It's a bad deal for the American public, and therefore uh, let's renegotiate it or get rid of it entirely. NAFTA is, as you know. Uh, in negotiation now, uh, and there is a feeling that uh, the outcome of it should be, at least from the administration's perspective, that uh, we, we should have a trade surplus with our trading partners, not a trade deficit as it has been perennially, perennially been. And so that, that seems to be the criteria, uh, never mind that uh, some of these economies are much smaller than our own, they have smaller populations, and it's not surprising that there is such a deficit in the, in the trade of goods, but there are other dimensions to free trade agreements that you don't hear much of. One of them is the ease of financing, or the ease of investing from one, board, one country to the other. Uh, and then another one, of course, is uh, the financial transactions, the ease of doing that, uh, coverage of intellectual property, and just the, the general idea of people moving back and forth and having these connections and starting businesses and contributing to businesses, it's a far richer uh, experience. And the results are multifaceted, much more so than just simply a, a lower tariff on goods that are passing back and forth. It also seems that Michigan directly uh, benefits from trade agreements, in particular NAFTA. Your top two trading partners are Canada and Mexico in that order. I think it's about 40% of your international trade takes place between those two countries. So obviously, or, or these three countries uh, within NAFTA. So if anything were to happen to that, that changed the balance of it uh, and, and made, either, um, made for less trade, less investment, disruption of the supply chains that are currently uh, in place, particularly with respect to automobile parts and other kinds of things, it would have a particularly negative effect on uh, the Michigan economy. Another trend, uh, logistics and e-commerce. Now, certainly within the last few years, it has become far easier to sell a good from the United States to a buyer in almost any other country. You don't need a giant infrastructure. You need certainly some information about how to do it, but it's a whole lot easier than it has ever been before. So anybody, including the waterless urinal company uh, and, and thousands of others uh, that uh, the Michigan uh, State University has assisted in the past, the Trade Center, uh, these, these companies now are trading across border with very little infrastructure, and they're doing so um, you know, on, on a fairly daily basis. They're taking advantage of Alibaba, the Chinese uh, e-commerce uh, network, uh, and certainly uh, the, the Amazon uh, and eBay. Uh, all of these are handling tremendous things. They have war warehouses overseas uh, in, uh, in China and other markets where small companies can actually warehouse a certain supply of their goods so that they can be fulfilled very easily and delivered uh, quickly. So uh, the, these uh, trend, that trend in particular is, is relevant because many more small and medium-sized enterprises can participate in uh, international trade than ever before. Uh, another trend is sustainability. And, and this basically means uh, economic, um, or sorry, environmental, uh, sustainable, uh, technology and the environment in general. Uh, people all over the world now are aware of climate change, they're aware of pollution in the environment, and they're, they, they want to vote, they want to buy with their, with their heart, and so they're looking at products and services that are economically sustainable. So any company uh, out there in the United States that has a technology or has a product that is uh, environmentally sustainable or a service uh, is going to be in pretty good shape for the foreseeable future. Uh, th another trend is reshoring and the boom in services. Reshoring essentially is bringing these manufacturing jobs back 
to the United States, back to Michigan, and where they have where they left some years ago. Uh, there, there's a lot of uh, companies that are moving uh, their uh, production back to the United States because of uh, you know uh, aging workforce in other places, or just the cost of labor is going up in places like China and others where they had gone before. And this means that there's going to be a lot more manufacturing in the United States than there has been in the past. The difference will be that not as many workers will be necessary, and you know why. Automation, robots, uh, and changes in technology generally means that companies can produce far more with far less people. So uh, this, this will be uh, an issue uh, in the future. And we heard uh, one of the speakers mentioned earlier the uh, boom in the Michigan economy so that you now have uh, pretty full employment or soon to be full employment and companies are finding it difficult to hire uh, technically qualified workers. So, so that's almost the, the reverse. Uh, but there are places in the country still where people have been laid off and they don't have jobs. And naturally they're being, the, the blame is being put on globalization and internationalization. Uh, is that fair? Uh, to some extent, yes. Uh, but an, another part of it uh, simply means that uh, these folks need to be taken care of somehow, at least that's my opinion, until they're retrained into something else. And this means they can't just be left to their own devices. There needs to be things like uh, wage insurance for people who lose their jobs and have to be retrained, other retraining programs that can be laid on so that people who want to work can continue uh, to be able to work, but they're going to need more assistance than they've had in the past. And there are programs in place now to provide this. The, the, the laws are on the books. It's just that they have not been implemented successfully. Uh, and, and there probably isn't enough funding for it. And the funding that is there is now on the chopping block as well. So in, in this case, we're shooting ourselves in the foot because we need the retraining programs. We need the ability for, for people to train themselves up for these new jobs that are coming along that they're, they're not qualified to do now. Uh, and there needs to be funding at a national level. And if not at a national level, then certainly at a local level. So, uh, and services are becoming more important. Yes, manufacturing is coming back a little bit, uh, and maybe a lot over the next number of years, especially with uh, new technologies, such as the 3D printing, where uh, anyone can produce a, a product or a part, uh, and they can do it right there uh, in their small business, their tiny little factory. They don't need an enormous storage place for things. Uh, they can use the 3D printing for just-in-time manufacturing purposes. That, I think, is another trend uh, that we'll be seeing uh, develop in the next few years. It's already here. Uh, so services uh, for international, uh, there'll be a lot more of that. Um, one service that is perfect uh, example uh, is uh, three men in a truck. Is it three men or two men? Two. All right, I added a third. See, we're trying to help with the unemployment <laughs> situation here, <laughs> adding one more. It's a great company. Uh, we've worked uh, with them through the Department of Commerce in the past, and they now are in 50 or 60 different countries. This is a franchise. Uh, it's, it's an idea that sprang from uh, the owner's uh, head, uh, and she created the company more than 10 years ago. I profiled her in one of the books, uh, and her family members now are, are part of it. And it's a big, big operation, franchising like crazy all over the place. That's a service. Conover Gould, we're a service. Uh, we now have clients in the Middle East. We have one in Canada. It's the Quebec uh, provincial government. And uh, we also have a university in Nigeria, Africa. We're a small company out of Washington, D.C., woman-owned, 30 years in business. And now we have, we're kind of a micro multinational. And we, we do uh, strategic planning, strategic communications for these companies uh, and governments. And, and we're now uh, a micro multinational. And uh, so there, there are many uh, examples uh, of this sort. And certainly, you know, our economy is a service-oriented economy. We have a surplus in it uh, and a deficit in manufacturing. So services, is going to be, services are going to be even bigger in the future. Now, the creeping protectionism is certainly a concern. And you know, as nativism, uh, anti-immigration, 
fear of uh, change, fear of internationalization, uh, uh, antagonism towards it increases, it means that uh, companies, or countries rather, will try to set up various barriers to entry. Uh, and, and the barriers will take various forms. They will be uh, punitive tariffs. There will be uh, non-tariff uh, barriers, such as all kinds of red tape that governments will spin out in order to protect their own producers against uh, incursions by foreigners. And that means uh, it will be somewhat more difficult uh, to, to engage in cross-border trade than it was in the past, because we'll have all of these different things cropping up all of the time. And it doesn't mean uh, you know, the end of the world by any means, but it does mean that we have to be monitor these things very carefully, and our government uh, will have to be extremely vigilant in trying to um, make sure that these, agreement, that these agreements that we have, the trade agreements that we have, the World Trade Organization uh, rules are uh, adhered to. And, and that, that, doesn't, uh, that it doesn't drastically reduce trade, because if it does, we'll obviously all be negatively affected. Uh, the other trend uh, is the rise of regional economies. And what I mean by that is, is yes, nation states are still important, but as you see in our own capital, uh, there's a lot of uh, mistrust about uh, w the, the international climate, uh, and there's a lot of pushback against internationalization and globalization, and, and we're considering our own um, uh, trade, uh, or sorry, our own tariff and non-tariff barriers, which will reduce the amount of imports uh, and probably will reduce the amount of exports as well if uh, they continue in the direction that they're going. They're, not to say that they will, because there's a lot of business interests uh, at play here. It's become a very divisive political issue. Uh, you've read, of course, in the um, newspapers and the media about uh, the CEOs of some large companies that are suddenly becoming very active. Well, a place that they haven't been very active is making the case for the benefits of trade. When was the last time you heard a CEO from a major bank or a logistics company or a manufacturer go to before the public and say, here are the reasons why trade is important for the American economy and why the simplistic arguments being used to attack it are wrong and need to be fixed. When was the last time you heard that? I talked uh, one day to a friend who works for a major logistics company. I said, where is the head of that logistics company? Why isn't he out in the public making the case for uh, international trade. And the reason, the answer he gave was, well, he is out there, he's talked to some people, but as a company, we've not taken a position on what we should do publicly. My feeling is, is that this is a very important issue and that we all need to make sure that our own publics in this region, in this area, understand the importance of it to uh, people in this community. Uh, there, therefore, uh, it, it is a local issue, and people here have to get are active and have to become even more active uh, in the future. And then finally, uh, and I think I alluded to this first, the income inequality uh, and the workforce. Uh, these are also very divisive issues. Um, you know, there's been a lot of discussion here. Uh, some mentioned the high school programs, taking kids out to look at how manufacturing is done. And, and I think that's a wonderful program and a wonderful idea because we really have to see holistically how the system works together and how the education makes a contribution to our competitiveness in the future. And that is a local issue. It's not a national issue. Uh, and then uh, the next slide. So those are the major trends. And then I would, and there, of course there are many others, but I think those are the ones that particularly uh, resonated with me. And, and, and this is, I think, a potential solution to some of the trends that are not going in the right direction. And what I call it is the global entrepreneurial ecosystem, or G. And what I've heard you describe so far, and the conversations that I had before this event started was, you have a G right here. And it's a pretty powerful one. And it's a pretty effective one. And I've traveled around the country in my previous jobs, and I would have to say, and I'm not just doing this because you provided me with a free lunch, I would have to say that this is one of the more impressive 
local programs that I have seen anywhere in the country. And it's impressive because you're here, you're talking to each other, you're helping each other, you have these incredible resources within, you know, uh, a, a couple of miles uh, drive. What are the resources? They are higher education institutions, and not just uh, the Uni Michigan State University, the community colleges are also involved in this. This is rare. It's, it's unusual to have universities and community colleges working together in the same place on these tough economic development issues. But it's happening and it's happening here. You have your good uh, and strong and solid economic development organizations that play a huge role in making the community open for inward investment. And the inward investment has been tremendous uh, in this state. Uh, you've attracted all kinds of companies. I think it was 200,000, that seems to be, not companies, but the number of jobs uh, that, are, uh, that, that were created as a result of inward investment. And, and these, are, these are manufacturing companies in large part, but they're also medical um, equipment. Uh, they're, uh, to a certain extent, s services, um, but mainly manufacturing. And so these are good jobs, they're decent paying jobs, and of course what they also bring are things like training programs. So the local workforce that is working uh, there at the place, they are getting uh, training from the foreign entity that comes over and trains them in their kinds of manufacturing processes, which equips those young people or middle-aged people or whoever happens to get the job with new skills that they can use for other jobs and future employment. So it's very, very important to have that. Um, the inward investment here and make sure that the climate, the lower tax rates, uh, the great infrastructure, the airports, roadways, and things that you have continue to be top notch because that will separate you from everyone else. Uh, then you've got your state and federal uh, business development and trade programs. Uh, you, we've already introduced to some of those individuals, my colleagues, the small business development centers, uh, another very important uh, piece to that, that uh, element because what they're doing is they're helping startup businesses get ready by understanding business planning and to a certain extent uh, how to do cross-border e-commerce and how to find buyers in other countries. Very important. The, you know, having strong financial options, someone said that there are incentives for businesses to do this stuff. That's great. Keep them coming. Uh, the banks have a big uh, role to play. Law firms have a big role to play with their international experience and expertise. Uh, diaspora organizations. Michigan has, is a great multicultural place, right? I, I lived in Detroit one summer when I used to work for ABC News, and I understand what a tremendously rich uh, multicultural place it is. A lot of these folks are joiners. They have uh, civic organizations, the you know, friends of Nigeria, the uh, uh, you know, Chinese Americans abroad, uh, and all kinds of uh, organizations of this sort, which I would argue also comprise, maybe to a sort of a second tier, but one should, that should be considered as well in the G uh, that is particular to the, the greater uh, Lansing uh, or this part of Michigan. Uh, freight forwarders, the FedExes, the UPSs, the DHSs, all very important, DHLs, but very, very important because they have the know-how. They can do the paperwork, which is less and less now than ever before. You, a lot of people are scared uh, that there's too much regulation, uh, there's too much paperwork, we're going to get into trouble if we're not f filling it out right, so why even bother? Uh, and then we hear about these trade agreements going down the tubes and we hear about, you know, th these barriers that are being thrown up. Oh, it's all too much. It's too, it's just too, it takes too much out of me. I don't have enough hours in the day. I have a, a business which has, you know, very tight uh, margins and there's just no way to do it. Well, th the news is, is that there's a lot of help to assist in those things and you don't have to do it all of your, yourself. Uh, and you can, you can actually get uh, assistance. A lot of it is automatic, digital, online, and it doesn't really require a great deal of time. And then, uh, of course, uh, your logistics providers, uh, the f which include the freight forwarders, but others as well, uh, who can assist you in this process. And there are many others. Uh, all of you here have a, a contribution to make, and you're not necessarily on this list. Next slide, please. Okay, so what I'd like you to do very quickly now, uh, now that you understand the big trends, some of them anyway, and now you understand this concept of the G and where you are in relation to other places where your G is operating, if you'll take 
five minutes, no more, at your tables and each come up with one idea that you can do to strengthen this G. Five minutes, just discuss among yourselves, come up with maybe one idea that, that I can go around and call selectively on you. You'll have to perform, it's not just me up here. It's your turn, take five minutes, come up with a, a great idea of how you're gonna strengthen the G. Okay, uh, table number, going to call you at random, number 13, lucky number. What is your one suggested idea? Yes, please. Uh, let me come around. Hold on. Let me come to you. Here we are. Oh, thank you very much. Here you go. Hi, my name is Edna Njoku Frenchwood. Yes, Edna. There's, a, there's a mic. Thank Great. you. Uh, you mentioned Nigeria twice tonight, born and raised in Nigeria. Oh, wonderful, so. wonderful place. Um, the AMA team at the Lansing Community College will be putting together textbooks and sending them to Africa to help professors that don't have um, the right resources to teach. And uh, personally, I'm working on a network that helps to play African content on TV here. And we have an event where we're bringing a real life African princess to Lansing in a couple of weeks. Kwisa was speaking on the platform as well. And uh, she's gonna share some of the work she's doing here and how she's uh, helping to facilitate the link between the diaspora and the Africans here. Wonderful, Thank great, you. great work, appreciate it. All oh, and I'm at WILX. If you wanna advertise, I'm your girl. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fine. <laughs> here, here's one. Yes, number 18. Thanks, Chris. Thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Carl Klimek, and I'm a career educator in the K-12 space. And so Steve and I were chatting, and we, we've done a lot of work together with the talent readiness and talent preparation for that K-12 pipeline. And uh, I would just really encourage all of you, no matter what line of business you're in, uh, our organization has worked throughout the state in trying to get kids aware of what is available to them and their parents because the teachers are being handcuffed a tremendous amount by overstandardization of instruction and curriculum. And consequently, what you need is not getting to the kids and their parents. So we would really encourage you to do yes with the, the two-year and four-year institutions, but the talent pool is ready for your influence at a much younger age, eighth, ninth, 10th grade. So we would encourage you to approach your schools, approach those teachers in business ed or in, in any of the industries that you might represent and boldly go in and say, we need kids coming into these colleges because the colleges are looking for them too. Um, so I'm education's business taking positive actions on the Michigan Business Network and we focus on positive stories about what's happening in our schools where kids are really getting the kind of good quality education that we all expect. So don't take your eyes off that high school and middle school age group. Thanks. Oh, that's fabulous. Uh, and there are, I just learned, a couple of great uh, immersion programs for Chinese. There's one here in Lansing. There's another in Grand Rapids. Uh, one of uh, Kendra, my, my former colleague, uh, one of her children. Both of them are? Uh, both children are in the Chinese immersion program here in the region, which is a fabulous thing. Also, what I'm hearing is communicating things. I, did, I mean, how many of you knew uh, about this particular connection and, and what he's trying to do here? Uh, we've, we've got to tell the story to the entire community so that they know. And you've got to tell them, you have to tell them what you told them, and then you have to tell them again because it won't sink in otherwise. This then begins to change the narrative from globalization is bad, uh, internationalization is, is costing us hugely as a, as a country and as a culture, to we need to be open. This is who we are, this is part of our narrative, and we need to be more open than we have in the past. 17, an idea from you. Hi everyone, I'm Chris Twitchell, I'm with the Neogen Corporation and we talked amongst our group here. I think that one of the biggest things that, that Neogen does is we really are focusing hard on our regulatory division. Uh, Neogen has thousands and thousands of products that we import and export um, around the world and the restrictions are so um, hard now on our chemicals and having things registered um, in the different countries so we're really focusing on our workforce and educating them, making sure they're ready, and we know what needs to be done to get the job done. So it's kind of what we do. 
Right, that's important. And you know, what I heard uh, just the other day was that people, you know, foreign companies are having trouble finding qualified people in this country, not just because they don't have the skills, but because they, they lack the show up for work readiness. They have stuff in their bloodstream, and when they're tested, it doesn't work. So we've got this thing called an opioid crisis in the country. Uh, I was uh, flying in this morning, and this guy in my seatmate next to me was saying to me, do you believe this? Here's this article. One out of every eight American adults is an alcoholic. And with that, he ordered a second gin and tonic. Uh, so, uh, you know. Thought, he was oh. just doing his bit, Doug. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Cut him off. Uh, number seven. Hold on, Jack. I know you want the mic. What, uh, what we think is important that, that our government leaders are aware of uh, what, what's being discussed here. And so we want to make sure that uh, we support candidates, uh, which our firm is working hard to do, that have the global vision as opposed to being fixated on uh, a particular street activity or something of a very local nature and being influenced uh, policy-wise to be focused on uh, a narrow vision. And so we need to support political leaders in the government who um, are more or less have a world view and global view. And that means that they are interested in uh, training young people uh, to take the skilled jobs. And that means they're adjusting to the robot culture and uh, obviously it's gonna happen, so those workers who are worried about being displaced instead of uh, getting involved with stopping the automated manufacturing, that we find new places and new professions and new jobs. And that means we have to work within the school districts, within the community colleges, so there's a lot of revision and revamping that has to be done, and we need the proper political leaders to do that, and that's what we're working to support. Great point. Thank you so much. Ah, there we are. And you know that's another sort of mini theme that has come up here, and that is while you're doing many of the things that are necessary as an ecosystem, there still seems to be a need to coordinate better, uh, to go deeper, to prioritize some of the efforts and to be able to speak with one larger, more powerful voice. How that's done, I'll leave it to you. I don't know. It just seems like you have so many of the right pieces in place. It's just not that big of an effort. And remember, there's a lot of communities that are nowhere near where you are. They may have a good airport, but they lack something else. One little anecdote is, you know, I was talking to this guy who's been working with local governments on uh, attracting foreign investment. And I asked him, I said, you know, what, what have you noticed in speaking with all of these people and observing how they operate as to which ones are more effective than the other? And they pointed out, one was Pittsburgh, which uh, didn't surprise me, but I, I took note. Pittsburgh, as opposed to some of the other urban areas in uh, Pennsylvania, they are more effective, and it's also been borne out in the statistics in terms of foreign investment coming in, because everybody is speaking from the same script. That is, the talking points you hear at the Economic Development Office, you will hear at the Congressional Representative Office, you will hear from the president of the university. They're all on the same page. So what, whatever additional coordination you can do would be fabulous. Now before I take another table, what I wanted to do is just go quickly, two more slides I think I have. Uh, okay, so here's the Global Edge. This is a great, we're talking now about information resources. Global Edge has a fabulous website with all kinds of useful information for a small business that is looking to go global or is going global but wants to do it intentionally and strategically. So uh, there, there's tremendous information resources right here that is tailored to your particular needs and interests. Next one. Okay. Uh, it's tiny little, I'm not very good at PowerPoint, am I? So uh, th this, is, uh, this is the basic guide to exporting that uh, Thomas was, uh, I would say, enthusiastically 
uh, in, in talking about earlier. Uh, you, you can get it uh, any number of places. Amazon has it and you know all the other booksellers. Uh, that's probably the primer for you, which will lead you through uh, the steps necessary to do it right and to do it successfully. There are other books, too, that we've done. This one, I think you appreciate it. It's all case studies of small, medium-sized enterprises who have done it well. And one of the things that characterizes them, two very interesting things come out of this collection of cases. One is that the successful people, by and large, are ones that seek local assistance. One of the reasons, one of the secret bits of the secret sauce for them is to make use of the resources that are available in their G. They don't describe it that way. That's the way I'm describing it, but it is the G, and th this is all over the country. This is what they've done. The second thing is there's a disproportionate number of people here who come from other countries. So there really is something to be said about immigrants and their work ethic, but also their interest in internationalization and global. They are fearless when it comes to getting out there and saying, I've got a great product, I have a great service, I'm going to sell it to, who, to anybody, anywhere, who has the money to buy it. And out they go and they do it. So it's, it's that you know, native American entrepreneurial spirit that we're now seeing in people who come from other places. Want to make an argument for our immigration policy? Look at the people in this book, and it may change your mind. OK, uh, next slide. Doug, we, oh. pr we probably should cut it right here to get yes. a little Q&A in from of the course. audience, Let's if we it. can. One little uh, advertisement about this. I'm giving three of these away. So uh -huh. if, if you, if you um, want to do it from your business card, Fishbowl, Tony, pull out three names and we'll, uh, we'll give these away. <laughs> okay, well question, would it be more useful uh, to continue going around and asking each table to respond to the little exercise I did or, or you want to just have me answer questions? Frankly, you're more interesting than I am. So, uh, but we're not going to pay you as much. <laughs> no, exactly. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so, so what would you what would you like to do? You well, uh, only because it's on a business schedule, and I think uh, somebody give me a cue here. It's got to be one twenty-five, somewhere in there. So it's a, it's really a matter of what we've got time for. So, my guess is it, it would probably the Q and A would be All the right. best thing. Okay. Anybody have anything top of mind they want to ask? Doug? Okay, Mikhail. Thanks again for coming and speaking. It's been a really fascinating conversation, but my question for you is based on the news cycle and what's going on, I'm interested in, based on your background, what you think is the future as far as our relationship with China and, and Russia especially, and what's going on there? Jeez, sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, oh, I we're out of time, Mikhail. Yeah, sorry. right, exactly. Uh, I'll give him my telephone number. Um, uh, you know, I think w Russia will continue to be problematic for the foreseeable future. There's, you know, just these major, major, um, uh, you know, political, cultural, and other reasons why things aren't going to be better anytime soon. Uh, China, the relationship is much more complicated, and it's also, uh, I think, you know, much more beneficial uh, to both countries to continue to have uh, a good, open uh, relationship and keep the trade flowing. At the same time, China probably will have to make, in fact, not probably, must make some adjustments in terms of its protection of intellectual property and opening its market further. It's still a very tough market for Americans to compete in. And it's tough not because of cultural reasons, but it's tough because the government of China has added all of these huge barriers. Um, uh, on the other hand, you know, I, I foresee uh, in taking a longer term future, with the uh, immersion programs in Chinese language in, our, in primary schools here. Uh, I don't know if there's anyone else in the room, but I know Tomas said goodbye to his son uh, last week as he ventured off into college. I uh, said goodbye to my daughter, uh, put her on the airport in Boston for her flight to Shanghai, where she enters uh, the Fudan University in Shanghai for a year of language study. Uh, on, the, uh, on the other hand, we hosted a Chinese young woman at my daughter's high school for an entire year, two years ago. That same person is now a freshman at Princeton University, where she will spend the next four years. The uh, 
it's costing her parents $65,000 a year, which you know, is a huge sum of money for them. But somehow, they're managing, and they will manage for the next four years. And when I, you know, I said to the mother of the daughter uh, the other day, um, her English is better than my Mandarin, I said to her, well, aren't you going to miss your daughter? Because uh, I'm going to miss mine. She's gone for a year. And the mother said, uh, yes, I'm going to miss her, but she is my gift to the world. And that's the way I feel about my daughter. And I'm sure you feel about your children, if you have them, or other children that, who you know. These kids are incredible. They're really international. They're interested in making the world a better place. And they will engage with people without preconceptions and many prejudices. And I really think that that's a very optimistic thing for us for the future. Doug, thanks so much for your insights. We appreciate you being here. All right, very, uh, very quickly, Dave Lick, if you're still in the room, I saw you come in earlier. You are one of the winners of these. The other two, uh, Courtney, we got it to you from Dean, and uh, Dave, we got it to, uh, I'm sorry, Brad, we got it to you from uh, Shaheen. So we want to thank you all for coming today. Uh, again, want to thank all of our sponsors. Uh, can't say it enough without their support. We're not here. Uh, also want to call uh, attention to Dave Trumpy. Is Dave still here? He was the photographer moving around. Uh, great photographer. We've used him for a lot of years and we appreciate it. All the photos that he took will be uh, on the michiganbusinessnetwork.com site along with the video of this entire presentation in the day. So you can go to the site and pick all of that up. Uh, I also want to call attention to Tony Manji and uh, Jeff Mosier from my staff, as well as Mike Steibel and uh, Jeff McCowan, uh, Carissa Geiger, who couldn't be here, and Wade Tong. Um, again, all those videos are there. And again, thank you all for being part of, truly, Doug, thanks for pointing it out, uh, probably one of the colla most collaborative communities uh, on the planet. Cleveland, and I happen to know that story intimately, is one of the others. They all got together and said, this is where we're going. So with that, thanks so much for being here and have a very prosperous month. Remember that uh, next month, what is it, uh, October 10, our speaker will be Coach Tom Izzo. So we'll be in a little bigger room. You want to get your tickets early on that one because that'll fill up. Thanks for being here. Have a prosperous month.